trust in you. We thank you, Jesus, for the great confidence that we have in you because you've never failed us and never will. We bless your name this morning, Lord. And everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter and Tammy for leading us in worship. Praise God. Is my mic, am I on? I can't tell. I think I turned it on, but I'm not positive. Praise the Lord. Okay, God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So again, I'm saying I wanted to talk to you this morning about uh, kind of in relationship to what was being spoken by the Spirit last week through the uh, various members of the church here and how that God is going to uh, bring a restoration or a reformation to the church and uh, shake some things that need to be shaken. Amen. And what's left after the shaken is what God wants. Amen. And that's the thing that will impact the nation and the lives of the people that are all around us. Amen. Religion can't do that. Only the Spirit of God. And that has to come through the Bride of Christ or through God in flesh. Amen? So, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. In the meantime, I, I was thinking, you know, all of my life, I said I, I want to be someone. And I can see now that I should have been more specific. <laughs> Lord. You know, if ignorance is bliss, how come there aren't more happy people? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Well, how about that wind? Yeah. How'd, how'd you like that segue? Praise the Lord. What about the wind? It's really been bad. Hasn't the wind been awful? It's really been terrible. Praise the Lord. We know it has been. You couldn't even see the other day when it was snowing so bad. I was watching the national news, and they had some guy there from California, and he was saying, oh, yeah, I know they're talking about how bad the wind is. He said, out here, the wind has been so bad that it caused the giant uh, redwoods to bend over. I mean, that's some powerful wind. And they interviewed this guy from Iowa, this farmer, and uh, he said, well, hey, look, the wind's so bad here in Iowa, it's over 100 miles an hour. And he said, uh, well, I was out trying to feed the chickens, and he said, the wind was so strong he said, one of my hens had her back turned to the wind, and she laid the same egg six times. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, so California's got nothing on us. That's all I can say. Six times. That's a half dozen eggs. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, praise the Lord. Let's just go right to the Word of God here, and uh, we'll try to make some uh, analogies and some comparisons uh, with the church today and what Nehemiah was dealing with in his day. So I want to begin with Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. I've got quite a, several fairly lengthy scriptures, but it's only because of the context. I I, was, I read Nehemiah, I was telling Sally earlier in the week, I didn't really know where I was going. I did feel like God was trying to expand and expound on what was said here Sunday. Uh, but uh, some of the things that I'm going to say this morning, I have said before. This is not the same message, but it's based on Nehemiah. And so some of the things I'll say, will, will, you may, it may resonate. You may say, oh, well, I remember him saying that before. But... Uh, the point is that uh, God's wanting to do something and uh, for us to, to be able to flow with what God is trying to do, uh, amen, we have to be sensitive to what he's saying to the church. And obviously he said that to Ron to share with us for a reason. And we heard the other testimonies from people that kind of validated that or you know, amplified even what uh, Ron was saying. So that's the spirit that we have. We all have the same spirit, the spirit of Christ. And uh, so God is trying to talk to us uh, about these things, and that's why I want to share it with you again this morning. So 
if if you do hear something, don't think that okay, well, he's just pulled out an old message. No, I don't do that. I'll take bits and pieces from messages that I've preached before, only because they're relevant to whatever it is I'm speaking today. Sally can tell you, I've got totes full of sermons, and I don't go back through them. I just, when I'm done here today, I'm thinking about next week. Because we'll go home a lot of times, and she'll want to talk about today. I've already moved on from today's. It's just the way it is. If I don't, I can't ever get into the next thing that God's yeah. trying to do, if you know what I'm saying. So I don't listen to my old sermons. I don't go back and reread the notes. But sometimes things will come up. Mm-hmm. And if you've done this for as long as I've done it, you don't want to be redundant, but at the same time, things come back. Sure. And they come back in a way that you didn't see them the first time. It's just sure. like reading the Scriptures. You know, you, I could preach messages that I preached 30 years ago Amen. in a completely different light, in a, in a totally different context than the way I preached them 30 years ago because I was 30 years younger I hadn't experienced 30 years of what I've experienced and didn't have the same revelation that we have today so all of those things you know that for yourselves just from reading the scriptures you know you look at things today and you read the same scripture that you read 10 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago and you go whoa wait I didn't see that before I or I wasn't looking at it that way in the past so that's what we're dealing with okay so We'll begin here at Nehemiah chapter 1 and uh, go through verse 11. Nehemiah 1, 1 through 11. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Han and I, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So, if you haven't read Nehemiah, let me just preface this, which I should have already done. I read the book of Nehemiah this past week three times, and I read it in three different uh, translations, or, uh, you know, the, the, the King James, the uh, Amplified, and the Message Bible. Just because, I mean, it's a fascinating book, and it, it, it's weird, and I'll get into some of this stuff. It's where it's at in the Bible is weird because it isn't where it should be chronologically. It's, it's, it's at the same place where Ezra, Habakkuk, those, those books, it, it's in that time frame, but it's put in a different weird place in the Bible, and I'll tell you what I think the Lord spoke to me about that and the reason for it. But in the meantime, these are people that were in captivity to Babylon. They've been taken off into captivity. Some of them escaped. Some of them were let go because they were basically just farmers and ten- they had no real authority or power or what have you. And that's, so Nehemiah is in Babylon. He's still in captivity. And this brother of his and some other people come to tell him of the condition of Jerusalem. And so they're telling him that there's people back, there are people back in Jerusalem, the people that escaped the captivity, people that have been set free or what have you, and they're back there. And they said the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So the city's in ruins, basically. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, this is all Old Testament. So remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. So he's just saying back to God what God had already prophesied would happen. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. So again, Nehemiah is just quoting scripture back to God. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. 
O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So he's saying, give me favor in the sight of the king. Now, again, I'll just say this. Physically, Nehemiah is right in the middle of the Bible. But chronologically, it's at the end of the Old Testament. So in Nehemiah, we get a glimpse of the last of Old Testament history just prior to the 400 years of silence leading up to the birth of Jesus, the Word of God in the flesh. So as I was reading it, I, I said I read it three, through three times in different uh, translations, and I noticed, the one thing I noticed, that first of all, I can't figure out why would it be put here. It doesn't make sense. It's after all of these other books here, the Psalms, Isaiah. Uh, it's after that. It's, historically, it happened after that. So it's weird that it would be here. But what the Lord showed me was it's right next to Esther. They have a similar message. Esther is the bride coming into her fullness. Mm -hmm. Amen. She comes before the king and makes demands. Yes. that would have been threatening could have cost her her life right. and the lives of her people. Mm -hmm. But she boldly goes before the king because she believes what God's word has said to her. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about you were created for a time such as this. The bride of Christ is created for a time just like this. Mm -hmm. Amen? And so uh, by faith, she uh, steps out and does what the bride does. Amen? And she does it by faith because there's this guy, Haman, who wants to steal, kill, and to destroy her influence uh -huh. in the nation. Uh -huh. The influence of God through the Jews that are in captivity there, right? All right, so in Nehemiah, there's this same deal. Nehemiah is going back to reestablish or build up the city, which we know to be us, uh -huh. I'll read the scripture to you from, from uh, uh, Revelation, but the truth is sh we are the new Jerusalem yes, city come down out of heaven. Uh -huh. So this is a type of what Nehemiah is doing uh, with the city of Jerusalem that lies in ruins. Amen. And he's dealing with this Sanballat and Tobiah who are doing everything they can to frighten him, to intimidate the people that are there, and to stop the reformation or reformation of the church. Yeah. In this case, the reformation of Israel or the restoration of the nation. Uh -huh. Okay? So that's where, we're, that's where we're coming from. So Nehemiah is in captivity, and he learns of this dilapidated state of Jerusalem, this non-functioning city, amen, that God has made all these promises to. So he sits down to weep, and he prays to God for four months. Now, God had promised through Isaiah that, and, and Jeremiah that Jerusalem and the temple would be rebuilt. Now that's why the chronological order of this is more important than the physiological or location of the book because if you read it this way, you'd wonder, well, how would he know what Isaiah said because Isaiah didn't come until after the Psalms and after all the... You see what I'm saying? He had this, the writings. They had the scrolls of Isaiah and Jeremiah and these others. And that's what he was basing his prayer on. God, you said that you were going to deliver us. You were going to do these things. And so that's what he's doing. He, he, he promised through Isaiah and through Jeremiah that Jerusalem and the temple would be rebuilt. Amen? Now, number one, Nehemiah understood God's word. And number two, Nehemiah's actions were based on confidence in God's word. Right? Yes. So he knew what the word said, and he acted on what the word said because of what it said. Amen? Now, look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 9 and verses 4 through 6. These people were in a covenant with God. 
And even though they had failed, he said, all you got to do is turn back. The moment you turn back, mm -hmm. I'll reestablish the covenant or the covenant will begin to operate the way it's supposed to once you do this. The Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Now here's the point for this is simply, there are in the church... Now, this is Old Testament, so we understand he's not talking about physically murdering people. But he's saying, look, the people you want to respond to are the people that have the mark. Uh -huh. We've been sealed, the scripture says, we have been sealed or marked with the Holy Spirit. Amen? I know we got lots of scriptures in, in Revelation about the mark of the beast and so on and so forth, and I've talked about that before. It may be, it may not be, but my feeling is you either have the mark of Adam, or you have the mark of Christ, which simply means you either have his spirit or you've got a natural spirit. Uh -huh. Amen? And that's what he's referring to here. He said, here's the people you want to pay attention to, the people that have the mark, mm -hmm. the people that are sealed, the people, because there's going to be lots of people in the city, a lot of people in Jerusalem to this day, lots of people in Jerusalem, but they're not spiritual. Many of them are not even believers. They're agnostics just because they're a Jew. That's what Jesus said. You know, man is not a Jew simply because he's been circumcised or because he has Jewish parents. A real Jew is a child of Abraham or someone who lives by the faith of God's word. Uh -huh. Amen. So, you see, fundamentally, the Bible is not about us. It's about God's plan to redeem the fallen miserable world and to restore it to its glory that it was created to be. Mm -hmm. So Nehemiah knows that there's way more at stake here than just the, rest the restoration of some people mm -hmm. and their national sovereignty. Right. Stay with me. He understands. It says he understood the scriptures and acted on his understanding of that. So he knows, because if he understands the Scripture, if he really knows what the Scripture is saying, he knows, amen, this is not about uh, Isaiah. This isn't about Jeremiah. This is about God. Right. This isn't even about us. It's about God being revealed for his true reality, for his truth, and for whatever he has said must come to pass. Uh -huh. All right? So he understands this is about not about just one group of people's independence or national sovereignty or rebuilding their country or their nation or their temple. This is about God. And that's why it's important. Amen? And that's why the church is important. Not because it's about us, but because it's about God. Yes. Amen? So he's interpreting the present problem in light of the whole word of God. Not just one little isolated thing. Uh, look, let me show you that. In Revelation 21, verse 2 is where he talks about, and I saw New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That's us. That is the church. So that's the parallel here between uh, Nehemiah going back to rebuild Jerusalem and God reestablishing the true Jerusalem, which is His church. Yes. Amen? There's a restoration and a reformation that needs to take place in both. Right? So I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Amen? So, again, Nehemiah is interpreting this, the, the, the problem that he's dealing with right there at that time in light of the entire scripture that's available to them. All right? Which is what we have to do. We can't just take a scripture or something that fits our situation today and then make something out of that. You have to use the entire scripture. Exactly. What's the entire scripture talking about? All right, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. So he says, this is the, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Amen. 
And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, in the palace, praise the Lord, that Han and I, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Verse 3. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and gates thereof are consumed with fire? And it came to pass... One through five, I'm sorry. What? One through five. Mm -hmm. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. So one act of faith, I apologize if I confuse some of you. I was reading in chapter one, she was in chapter two, which is where she was supposed to be, and me too. Praise the Lord. But this is one act of faith. So he has the word of God, and he takes this act of faith by going before the king, depressed and bummed out, which could have cost him his life, because mm -hmm. you don't get to be unhappy in the king's presence. Okay. Amen? Yeah. That's what he says. You gotta, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We shouldn't be depressed. We shouldn't be exactly. bummed out. We shouldn't be whining to God. We should be celebrating. Amen. So here he is before this king and he comes in and he's you know, moping and doping around. But yet the king has favor on him. He says, here's what I'd like to have. Let me go back and rebuild the city. Let me go and bring restoration, reformation. Right? So Nehemiah's journey to Jerusalem then, he's, he's given the approval of the king. And his journey to Jerusalem then is recorded with just four words. Nehemiah 2, verse 11. And I went, he says, so I came to Jerusalem. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. His whole journey. Now listen, this is a thousand miles away. You can check it on the maps. It's a thousand miles from Jerusalem. And it's through deserts where there are bandits, where there are marauding tribes of, of nomads that kill and take it, cat people slavery and, and all these other things. There are other enemies of Israel and enemies of Babylon. Right? right. He doesn't say anything about, man, what a trip, a thousand miles, man, through the desert, hot, bugs, gnats, flies, danger, threats. He doesn't say anything. He just says, I came to Jerusalem. Amen? I just came to Jerusalem. As if the journey was nothing. Yeah. It was the arrival. It was the getting to Jerusalem. All right, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Now, faith comes by hearing. The scripture says that's where we're going. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word actually translated God there is translated in the Greek, to be Christ, or the word for Christ. So, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Which makes sense, since He is the word in flesh. Amen? Praise God. Nehemiah chapter 2, 11 through 14. Stay with me, I know I'm kind of just dragging my feet here. but Praise the Lord. Nehemiah 2... 11 through 14. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. That's important. And I arose in the night and some, I and some men with me told, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and to the dung port and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. So Nehemiah has come into the city of Jerusalem. And he's there, literally, he says, for three days. Amen? Anytime you see the terminology three days in Scripture, 
it ought to remind us of the three days and the three nights of the personal work of Jesus Christ. Amen? The finished work. Hallelujah. So Nehemiah is coming into Jerusalem to assess the condition of the city in the nighttime. Praise the Lord. He discovers that the walls are broken down. He sees that they're burned with fire. They're in Babylonian captivity. Amen? And this is a picture, in fact, a powerful picture, of the church in the beginning stages of restoration or reformation. Yes. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 5 through 13, and I'll just show a few parallels here. But again, the location of this book next to Esther the, the parallels in what God is trying to do here to restore a physical city and what I believe God is doing now to restore a spiritual city, yes. the bride herself. So yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children. Now, these are the people talking to Nehemiah. These are the people that have been there in the city. Okay. They've escaped captivity or they were let go to come to Israel. <coughs> So now, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren. He's talking, they're talking about the ones that are still in captivity in Babylon. Mm -hmm. So we're not any better off than they are. We're just like them. Our children as their children. And lo, we bring, in, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and vineyards. And Nehemiah says, I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, You exact usury, or you're charging interest, every one of his against your own brothers. And I set a great assembly against them. This is the ministry and the uh, upper echelons, if you will, of society. The, he calls them nobles, but they're the people of influence and the religious leaders. And he says unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? Or are you going to do the same thing, that we got them out of the captivity of the heathen, and now you're going to do the same thing to them that the heathen were doing to them? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held their, they their peace and found nothing to answer. So he said, You're treating these Hebrews, these other Jews, the same way they were treated by the enemy, right. by their captives. You're making them pay you for their food. You're making them pay uh, interest on the land that you took away from them, and you're taking their children into captivity to make them bond servants or slaves, basically, to pay off the debt. And he says, so ought you not to walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you let us leave off this usury. Quit charging them. Quit ripping them off. Quit taking things away from them and making them your servants and your slaves. Restore, he said, I pray you to them, even this day, their land, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and of the corn, the wine, and the oil that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests, and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. So he calls the priests, and he tells him, You've got it now. I want, to, I want you to swear before God you're going to do this, and you're going to quit doing what you've been doing, right? I also shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor. How about some shaking going on, Ron? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. What's not shaken, what's left, is what God wants. So in this is the labor that performeth not this promise, even thus be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did according to the promise. Praise the Lord. So people who had been in bondage to the enemy once, they were loosed, were in bondage now to their religion and to their religious and political leaders. Yeah. Praise the Lord. People are set free from the wages of sin. The king sets them free. And then what happens? The church comes along and makes them subject to their religious law. 
Can you see the parallel? We're talking about two, the same thing. One is a physical thing. One is a spiritual thing. Yes. Amen. God's getting our attention through this to see what is the condition of the church. Because look, these people had been back from the original captivity and they'd been there. They hadn't done anything to change anything. They're living in the squalor. They've, they've accepted their, their, their uh, identity as poverty, as poor people, as slaves, as just getting by, just trying to make it. Right? So Nehemiah comes along and he's trying to set things back to the way it was intended to be, the way God meant it to be, that these people are marked people. These are people with a seal. These are people of God. These are people that have power and influence, and it should be yes. recognized. Yes. Amen? So look at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 12 and 13 again. So here's what happens. We bring people into the church, like my friend, talk to him about the Lord and everything else, and he's dealing with his own kind of issues and captivity and and bondages, and, and so on and so forth. And so we bring them in. We say, come. You know, God wants to set you free from all of that. God wants to heal you and deliver you. We bring them in, and then we get them into the church and say, now, you know, you need to clean up. You need to quit doing that. You need to, I, I heard you drank a beer the other day, or I seen, you know, you had an argument with somebody, and so and so, and you know, you're, God's going to get you for this stuff. And the guy's going, what the hell? I just came from that. That's where I've been. And now you're going to start placing demands and usury and interest, amen, on top of what God has said is yours by inheritance. It, it belongs to you. Amen. Yes. So that's what the church is doing in a lot of cases. Yes. Amen. So he says, then said they, we will restore them. We will require nothing of them. Exactly. Exactly. Praise the Lord. How can they? They didn't, they, they didn't buy them out. It was God that got them set free, right? It was God that paid the price. And so will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and I took an oath of them that they would do according to the promise. Uh -huh. Also I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise. In other words, if you're demanding, God's shaking you. Yeah. If, you're making, if you're placing demands on people, religious demands, God said, I'm shaking this mess loose. Yes. And if that's what you're doing, you're going to... Get dumped. You're going to get lost in the, in the shaken. Amen. Even thus be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, Amen. Praise the Lord. And the people did according to the promise. All right. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherewith, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that the tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, due to, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would da even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Praise the Lord. So here's Nehemiah. And he's, what Nehemiah is all about is the restoration of a city and a people according to the faithfulness of God's promise. That's what we just read for us today. And we should be looking at not just our immediate situation, but everything in light of the scripture. All the scripture is trying to show us is God's faithfulness to his people, to his covenant people. Yes. That's us. That's who we are. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 63 through 65. Nehemiah 7, 63 through 65. Another uh, quick comparison here with what was going on there and what's going on now. And of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillah, 
uh, which took one of the daughters of Barzillia, the Glidiite, to, to wife, amen, and was called after her, their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, were they as polluted put from the priesthood. And the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Now, what's he saying? The ministry, half of the ministry that was ministering weren't from God. They couldn't trace their genealogy back to the people that God said, these are the people that are supposed to be doing the preaching here. They just claimed it, right? And so God said, until we can find proof of their genealogy, they've got no business not only not preaching, but not receiving the tithe, the food, the things that go along with it for the ministry because they're unclean. They're not the people that are supposed to be doing this, right? So the ministry was not from God. It was from men. And God said, until God speaks specifically... These people have no business trying to minister to you, uh -huh. trying to teach you, because they are not hearing from God. Therefore, they cannot share what God's saying to you. Yeah. They're just giving you men's, you know, solutions, uh -huh. men's ideas. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah 8, verse 1 through 12. Stay with me. I'll, I'll go faster here pretty quick. Praise the Lord. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to, to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law, brought the word of God, before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And all the ears of the people were attentive unto the book of the law, which is the word of God. It was just how it was referred to in the Old Covenant. And Ezra the scribe stood up on a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, and Uriah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, and Malachi, and Hashem, and Hezbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people when he opened it, and all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, and lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Jabbathai, Hadajah, Maasiah, this will give tongue twisters, Kelatiah, Hazariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law or the word. Uh -huh. And the people stood in their place. They were fixed, right? So they read in the book of the law of God. They read the word of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Now the people understand the word now. Uh -huh. They were getting all kinds of mixed messages because they were getting messages from people that weren't even called of God, that weren't, didn't have the truth. These people are now hearing it, and it's saying they're, they're understanding the truth of what this word is about. It isn't just a story or something, but it's literally God's life that they're sharing here. This, is, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And they used to cry in all the time because they know the word of the law is not good news for us. It's, it's exposing all of our failures, right? But he's saying, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then he said, go your way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Does that sound like a religious message? Go out and have a barbecue. Get a good bottle of wine or something, you know, and whatever. And send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our God. 
neither be ye sorry for the Lord, joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. See, here's the deal. When preached correctly and understood correctly, the word of the Lord brings joy, not fear, not anxiety, not stress, not I'm not measuring up. No, it sets you free. It, it makes you joyous. Praise the Lord. And half the things that you've been told were sin, you find out, weren't necessarily sin. Amen. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm not encouraging people to drink. I'm just saying a glass of wine is not sin. Exactly. Now, drunkenness is sin. Because obviously it has impact. It, it, it has other issues. But Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Right? So I'm just saying, I'm not encouraging people... You know, right. to stop at the liquor store on the way home and get a buzz going here. I'm just saying, exactly. this, is the, this is the command of the, of the true religious leaders is, hey, this is good news, man. God loves you. You need to be celebrating this. You need to get, get yourself a, you know, a rack of ribs, praise the Lord, and a good bottle and just have a, have a party. Enjoy it. Get everybody. And if you see people that don't have it, take them some. Give them some so that they can celebrate with you. In other words, I got the good news, and I got the good news, and it makes me just really feel good. Amen? It, it kind of like, you know, if you really understand what we've got, it's kind of a high. It's a spiritual high. You don't need to get all buzzed out because you're feeling good about things anyway because of what God has done. And he's saying, and, and if, it, if you got it, share it with somebody who doesn't have it. Give them, some, give them a portion of it. Let them feel the joy of the Lord. Let them experience the goodness of God, the love of God, the liberty yes. that God has for us. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 through 31. See, sharing the gospel, we used to think it was about giving them our doctrine. You know, there's so many steps to this is what you've got to do. And if, if I could just get them to take that, that's not, the gospel is good news. It is. I'm not saying there aren't doctrinal things, but that shouldn't be the way we approach people with our doctrine. We should be approaching them with the love of God, with the, 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 the fact that God wants to set them free. Yes. Yes. The joy of the Lord yes. is our strength. Praise the Lord. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to un unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Yes. All the things that we have, all the, the righteousness, all the holiness, all the peace, yes. all the joy, all the everything we have is because of God, not because of us. Uh -huh. Amen. That's the message the world needs to know. Because yes. they're still believing there's a bunch of stuff they got to do. Uh -huh. And they don't believe they can do it. And they're right. Jesus wants to give them a gift. Amen. 
to be set free, to be restored. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 now, verses 1 through 7. Praise the Lord. Night, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in meekness, in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Praise the Lord. So here's the thing. God doesn't exist for the sake of our enjoying Bible stories. But Bible stories exist for the sake of our enjoying God. Praise the Lord. Yes. Biblical stories are no more an end in themselves mm -hmm. than history is an end in itself or that the universe is an end in itself. There's a point to the story of Nehemiah. There's a point to the narrative of the story or the way the story is told. And the point is a person. Yes. Jesus Christ the Word made flesh, all the Word come to life. Uh -huh. Amen? In Nehemiah, the people have been under Babylonian religious confusion. And that has kept them blind to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's where most of the world is. That's why they want to take Jesus out of everything because they, don't, they, they are blind mm -hmm. to the work of Jesus. They don't have a problem with religion. Right. It's Jesus that they got the problem with. Because religion is the foolishness of man. Yeah. And Jesus, the wisdom of God. Yes. So the wise, our scholars from the universities, mm -hmm. are almost unanimously atheist or agnostics at best. Why? Because they thrive on the wisdom of the world, yeah. which is foolishness to God. One of the reasons these guys are in Babylonian captivity is because they did not keep the Sabbath. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 and 21. Now remember, this is all about Jesus. It isn't even about the rules and the regulations. It's about a revelation of Jesus. So one of the reasons these people are in captivity is because they did not keep the Sabbath. How many of you know Jesus is the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath? He is the perpetual Sabbath, right? Yes. So he says that thine eyes might be open unto this day, house day and night upon the place where thou hast said that thou wouldest put thy name here to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayed toward this place. Hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant and thy people Israel which they shall make toward this place. Hear thou from the dwelling place even from heaven and when thou hearest forgive. Praise the Lord. No, we're not in the right place. I need 2 Chronicles 36, oh. verse 20 and 21. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 20 and 21, where he talks about because the people wouldn't keep the Sabbath, they were taken into captivity. Why? So that the land would enjoy or experience the Sabbath rest. So that was part of the keeping of the Sabbath. It wasn't just every seven days, but every seven years there was a Sabbath rest for the land so that the land could be restored. They didn't do that. They were just digging and getting everything they could get. Right. And so God said, look, if you're not going to keep the Sabbath, I'll move you off the land altogether so it will have a perpetual rest. Right. So it will be in rest for years yes. until I restore you again. And that's exactly what happened. Then that escape from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord, this is what the Lord had prophesied by Jeremiah, again a previous prophet, even though he's later in the books, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So as long as there was no people there, the Sabbath was being kept to fulfill the word of the Lord. As long as she lay desolate, verse 22. 
Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished or fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Praise the Lord. You can't go. You're not going anywhere. Praise the Lord. So Nehemiah comes into the city at night. Well, we'll just move on, okay? They're there because they didn't keep the Sabbath. They didn't honor the Sabbath. They didn't make their focus the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He is yes. our perpetual rest. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll give you Sabbath rest. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So that's what they didn't recognize. That's the message. The message isn't just that, you know, they didn't do what they were supposed to do on the Sabbath. The message isn't even that they didn't give the land rest every seven years. The message is you're not getting the message of Jesus Christ. Right. You're making this about stuff, and you can't even do the stuff, and the stuff is all pointing yes. to Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. So he's a type. Uh, amen. You see in, in, in uh, uh, Second Corinthians, or excuse me, Second Chronicles, we read that why they were kept up, because they would not honor the Word of God concerning the Sabbath. Yes. So, again... We go back to uh, Nehemiah 1 and 2, and he comes into the city, amen, and in the night. Now, Nehemiah's name comes from the Hebrew root word Nahan. 5162, you can look it up in Strong's Concordance under the Hebrew, and it means comforter. So Nehemiah is a type of the Holy Spirit. He's coming, the Holy Spirit, to what? Restore the church. Make us function and operate by the Spirit and not by the letter of the law or not by rules and regulations, but by the Spirit of God. Yes. That's the reformation that we are experiencing right now, that we're yes. going through, that the church is going through. Amen? In various places, in various levels of, uh, and degrees, uh, in terms of how fast it's happening, how relevant it might be in any one given place. But that's the message. That's what God is doing by the Holy Spirit right now is restoring His city, His holy city, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So that when it does come down out of heaven, it's everything He said it was. Exactly. It's accomplishing everything He said it would accomplish. Praise the Lord. So Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And I'll show you a few things here. I've talked about these in the past, but just in the context of what we're discussing this morning, it's good to see it again. It's not redundant. It's just... It's repetitive because sometimes it's by the hearing and the hearing and the hearing that we are transformed. So the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Han and I, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. So in the ninth month... In the Babylonian calendar, and by the way, the Jewish calendar was the same as the Babylonian calendar at that time because that was the, their means of keeping, obviously, the majority of them were in captivity. So their calendars coincided in, those, in that sense. So in the ninth month of the Babylonian calendar, which is Chislu, Chislu means hope. Amen? It comes in the 20th year, he said, which is the number for redemption. And he comes to a place, Shushan. That's not Shished. Shushan. And Shushan literally means the lily place. Or lily being the symbol of resurrection, which is why we always have lilies on Easter, right? And there's one person with him. His name is Hanani. And that name means grace. So we've got a man called the Comforter coming in the month called Hope in the year of redemption in Resurrection Palace with a man by the name of Grace. Now tell me God isn't talking about the whole plan and not just some isolated incident that's taking place in a foreign country several thousand years ago. Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse 2.
And I gave my brother Hanani grace, and Hanani, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. So Hanani becomes the governor. In other words, grace begins to rule and to reign in the city. We are the city. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's the whole purpose of the new covenant. Yes, it is. Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So grace has to become the governor of our lives mm -hmm. for us to rule and reign. Yes. Therefore, grace has to be the governor of the church in order for the church to have the influence, yes. the impact, mm -hmm. yes. the effect that it was intended to have. Yes. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. So people say, ah, it's just grace, grace, grace. No, look, come on. It's over and over in the Bible. Unless grace reigns and rules, the church cannot be effective. Exactly. It just becomes another place of captivity. Uh -huh. It just becomes another dominant, overbearing, uh, false witness to God and His goodness. Yeah. And causes people to flee rather than to come and be embraced by this God. So I went up out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and the gates thereof which were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Now, again, I've taught on some of this stuff before, but just for the sake of the context of what we're talking about here today, I'm going to go back over some of it. If we're going to be part of the restoration and the reformation of the church, the new Jerusalem, we have to see the condition of the city or the church in the nighttime, in the dark, in the, without, revela without the revelation. Amen. In other words, if you don't look at it for what it truly is, you are passing on a false image. In other words... Yes, we have an idea, we have an understanding because of grace what it's supposed to be, but we have to look at it in light of what it actually is. Yes. Am I making sense? Yes. He goes out at night to see this thing, so he can't be influenced by any of the people, exactly. and also so that he sees it in its rawest, ugliest, right. poorest light. Right? right? Now, I'm not saying we should be depressed, I'm not saying we should be negative, I'm saying we should be honest. What is it we're looking at? What is it we're dealing with? And then move from there and go from that position, from that place. Amen? So, the dragon gate. I mentioned this before. There was, a, there was a Hebrew theory that a dragon was beheaded there, but it's speaking about Satan. Okay? And the first step of restoration, as far as the church is concerned, is people have to know the dragon or the devil is defeated. Yes. Amen? Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers. We make the devil out to be as powerful as he ever was. No, only if you're ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. Only if you don't know. You have authority over the devil. He is under your feet. He has been defeated. Now, a lot of places, they can't have church without the devil. Yeah. Amen. Because they use the devil to frighten the people to do what they want them to do. When in fact, if they would teach them the truth, the devil would be defeated and half of their battles would be over. Now we do have battles with people, with, you know, with life and with the natural. But the devil is a small part of our problems. It is. Yes. Amen. Unless you don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a church where all you hear about is what the devil's doing, mm -hmm. yeah. that's not a good idea. I had people leave the church. I've told this before, but when we started a church in Ankeny years ago, I had people get up and leave because I wouldn't preach about hell. One of them actually said, don't you love me, Brother Hamlin? I said, of course I do. Well, then why don't you tell us about hell? 
I said, are you planning on going? I mean, I don't need to know anything about hell. I'm not going to hell. Amen. I need to know about what, what's available to me here and in eternity. Amen. I don't need to talk about hell. I don't need to talk about the devil. They're, they're not a part of my life. They're not right. an influence. Only if, I'm not, if my mind is not renewed to the truth. The only time I want to talk about the devil is to set people free from the lies of the devil. Exactly. Amen? So, praise the Lord. Nehemiah 2, 13 and 14. So I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Okay? So, after Nehemiah comes into the city, after passing the dragon well and the dung port, he sees that the first steps of restoration is that we have to deal with the dragon, that he is defeated, that he's no longer a threat, except in our ignorance. Jesus just used the word of God whenever he spoke the word of God and the devil flee, mm -hmm. took off and left him. He'll come back, but he'll lead the same way if you'll use the same weapon. Exactly. The truth. So he says, first thing is the dealing with the, the, de the devil's defeated. The second thing, the dung port. And that is the defilement of religion. Remember when we read about the priests who were not, couldn't trace their genealogies? Mm -hmm. And the Lord said they're unclean. They're defiled. Because they aren't supposed to be doing this. They don't have my anointing. They don't have my call. They're not being led by the Spirit. They're just giving you natural intellectual information. It may be good. It may be smart. Some of it may be uh, beneficial. But it's not God. It's defiled by religion. Right. And that's what the dung port represents. You've got to get past the devil as being this powerful influence that's going to overwhelm you and realize he's been defeated. Mm -hmm. Keep your faith in that de defeated position that he has. And then don't let religion defile you or cause you to be unclean, meaning you're trying to do something that Jesus already did. Right. Paul said, I, just, I want to know nothing but... Christ and Him crucified. When I look at you, that's all I see. I'm not seeing faults. I'm not seeing weaknesses. I'm not seeing failures. I'm seeing you are victorious in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how we have to see ourselves. And if we don't see ourselves that way, it's really difficult to see others that way. Because if you find a lot of fault with yourself, it won't be long you'll be looking for faults in other people because you've got to justify your faults. I'm not the only screw up here. Right. And I'm really not. Praise the Lord. But we're all good in Jesus. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Now, he gets past the, the, the dragon gate. He gets past the dung port. And all of a sudden, he comes to the gate of a fountain. To what the scripture calls the king's pool. Which in the New Testament is called the pool of Siloam. In the Old Testament, it's Siloah. But they're the same place. Amen? Partly because in the New Testament, they're speaking... Uh, Aramaic, not many Jews were speaking Hebrew, not even Jesus. He spoke mainly uh, Aramaic or else Greek. So the words, words get changed around a little bit as a result of that. But look at John chapter 5, 1 through 9. Now, Nehemiah has come to the king's pool or the king's uh, gate or... or uh, The place of, of, of uh, access once you get past the idea that the devil is still powerful in your life. And once you get past trying to do things religiously, you come to a pool, another pool. It's the king's pool. It's the pool of Siloam in the New Testament where Jesus, where the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. 
And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Certain man there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years, when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been there a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. He's looking for human right? To put me in the water when the water is troubled, but I don't have anybody to put me in the tool, so when I'm coming, another steps in before me. Jesus said, Arise, take up your bed and walk. Another place, God, Jesus says to a man who's blind, he said, Go and wash your eyes. He spits in the mud, puts it on the man's eyes. He said, Go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. So what does it represent? Well, it, repre it represents the restoration of the church, the healing, the deliverance, the supernatural, the miracle, eyes being opened so we can see what it is God is saying. Amen? The dysfunction of the church not being able to move and to do what it's supposed to do. He's saying, get man out of it, and you can take up your bed and walk. Uh -huh. And immediately, I didn't go through for the sake of time, but immediately people are coming to him, the Jews are coming to him and saying, who did this? Yeah. It's the Sabbath, you know. Now, who did it? And the guy doesn't know who did it at first until then he sees Jesus later. And then he says, then he starts telling everybody it was the Lord. It was Jesus. Amen. How many of you know if the church was functioning the way it's supposed to function, we wouldn't have to give away bicycles, have potluck dinners, you know what I'm saying, and feed the neighborhood. But no, I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying the word gets out pretty fast. When people are getting healed, when people are getting delivered, when people are being set free, when their lives are being transformed, it doesn't take long for somebody to say, hey, I, I could use some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not big on the religion stuff, but if, I, if you could get me to Jesus, yeah. yes. I'd be grateful. Because your eyes can be opened. Your lives can be transformed. That's what God is trying to restore the church to. Amen. And it can't happen unless it's about God and not about us. It has to be by grace. It has to be not me that does the works, but the Father that's in me. He does the works. I only do what I hear my Father say to do. I only do what I see Him doing. That's, that was Jesus' method, and it worked. Amen? No man to help. We don't need man. We just need more of God. Amen. Nehemiah 3, verses 13 through 15. And I'll show you why the problem with God wanting to get man out of it. I'm not against preachers of other denominations and so forth. I'm not trying to make them evil. I'm just saying, if God isn't the one that's doing the speaking, I don't care how eloquent the guy is or the woman is, it's not going to do you any good. Right. Amen. It just tickles your ears for a little bit, and then you've got to go deal with life. Right. So the valley gate repaired Hanun. The inhabitants of Zenoa, they built it, set up the doors. These are people that Nehemiah had told go out and get busy working on this city. So the valley gate, Hanun repaired. The inhabitants of Zenoa, they built it, set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof, and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate re repaired Malachi, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Bethren, and he built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalun, the son of Koz, the ruler of that part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof and the wall of the pool of Siloa by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. So he repaired, this guy repairs the pool of Siloam, the area surrounding it, and the uh, wall by the king's garden and the stairs that led out of the city. Amen? Out of the city of David. Led down from that pool out into the outside of the city. Amen? Praise God. All right. When Nehemiah gets there, he says, There was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. The walls caved in. The, 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 it's, there's just a small means by which to get through the wall to the outside, to the pool and so forth. When he gets there, he says... It was so down, it was so caved in and everything that there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. 
Now, based on Scripture, about redemption being the big story, right? He isn't simply talking about a donkey that he's riding. Now, he is riding a donkey. I'm not saying that. But there's something more significant being pictured here. Because this book is prophecy. Yes, it is. It's not story time. It's about God. Yes. About us connecting with God, not about us connecting to stories. Right. But the story is causing us to connect to the Lord. Amen? So the people that we deal with on a regular basis, and even us sometimes, worry about this beast that's coming in the book of Revelation. And I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying people's focus becomes on something out there in the future, mm -hmm. potentially. But I think the one that Nehemiah is dealing with is the one that we wrote in on. Mm -hmm. Our old nature. Our Adamic nature. Our inability to understand who we really are in Christ. Yes. Amen. You can't get to where God wants you writing your old nature. If that's my liver transplant, tell them I'll be there at one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, you don't have to go there. I'll just read it to you from the Amplified. He says, so kill the dead, kill or deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses. Yeah. Those old nature kind of ways of looking at things, looking at life. Not just talking about going out and doing bad stuff. He's talking about the way you perceive life, yeah. the way you understand your relationship with God. Yes. See, what, what we see is that the beast he's dealing with is man's fallen state. Yes. Amen? And what does the church do? Resurrect it every Sunday. Yes. To talk about your failures. And that's why grace has to rule. Because you can't come into this thing riding your old nature. Right. You've got to dismount, amen, and hook up with Jesus. Yes. He's saying, the beast I was on, it couldn't come in with me. Yes. There wasn't room for both of us. Yes. So I had to dismount and come yes. in on my own. See, Nehemiah is checking out the city at night. And night is when you have no revelation. He's the light, the light that comes into the world, right? So until you pass the dragon well the dung port, and get a revelation of what took place outside the camp in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, mm -hmm. you're going to continue to ride your own beast. Mm -hmm. You'll live a life of religion yeah. or who you are in Adam instead of who you are in Christ. So true. Praise the Lord. You come to the king's fountain Right? The pool of Siloam. Jesus is who we come to. He's the healer. He's the living water. Yes. Amen? Drink of me and you'll never thirst again. Mm -hmm. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Amen? See, the place for healing is where the healer is. Amen. The place for your needs to be met is where your resource is yes. that supplies all your needs according to His riches and glory. Mm -hmm. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Why is He sitting? Because His work is over. Mm -hmm. He's resting. And we're supposed to rest in Him. Praise the Lord. So what we need, what the church needs, what humanity needs, is a revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not that it's almost finished, and now if you'll get into the right church, you can finish it by doing all the really good stuff that you're supposed to do. No. The revelation is 
It is finished. And we rest in his finished work. We trust in all that he has accomplished for us. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Praise the Lord. About done here. Glory to God. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Remember, this is in the same time, the same era, as Nehemiah. Amen? Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Or if you go back to the religion, or back to law, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Praise the Lord. So I said one of the, one of the reasons for captivity and, de, and the uh, detention uh, and the destruction, really, of the city was for not keeping the Sabbath. Praise the Lord. Well, we've come to the perpetual Sabbath. <laughs> Honor it. Keep it. Keep the Sabbath. Honor the Sabbath. Isn't that what it says? How do, we, how do we not honor it? How do we violate it today? By thinking that we have to do all over what Jesus already did. Exactly. It was a day of rest. He's a person of rest. Mm -hmm. The principle remains the same. It's just it's a spiritual application. We rest in His finished work. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to do stuff for approval. We're just believing the stuff that he did yes. that declares us approved, yes. accepted in the beloved. Amen? See, the church is being restored. I, I mean, I really believe this. Restored according to the faithfulness of God's promises. Not our plans, not our purposes, but according to the faithfulness of what he has said. Amen. That's what it will be restored to. That and our understanding and faith in those promises which is just simply trusting Him because He and His Word are one. Yes. Amen? The Comforter has come to us in a time of redemption into a resurrection palace. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. A house of God. A palace. Not just some dome. A mansion. Amen. And it has come to us by grace. Grace and truth by Jesus Christ. And that's how we have to see the condition of the city. The condition of the church. Yes. Being restored. Obstacles. Enemies that come and try to distract you from the rebuilding or the reformation. Try to get you back into the religious stuff and threaten you with the, what the devil's going to do to you and all the other kind of stuff. Those are lies. Yes, they are. We need to just say the same thing Nehemiah said. I'm busy building a wall here. I'm busy restoring a church. I ain't got time to talk to you, devil. Right? I haven't got time to listen to your threats. He that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. Yes. We're going to see this thing restored, and God will get the glory. Yes. And the church, see, in the darkest time, he says the light of God will shine brighter than it's ever shown before. Yes. In the darkest of situations. In the, in the most dismal looking circumstance for Israel, God showed up and he began to clean house. Yes. And what was left opened the path and opened the door for Jesus to come. For that word that they were trusting to come in the flesh. Yes. It took 400 years. Uh -huh. Not a word from God. I'm sure there were people screaming and hollering. We know that Israel was, they were all up in arms wondering what God's going to do. What? He's going to do just what He said He was going to do. And He's going to do it 
when you're ready for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Nothing is impossible with God. See, it's easy to look at the, the Scriptures, look at the stories, and see them as isolated, separated things that are just about somebody that happened. No, it, it, this whole thing. See, we, we, we get to the point where we think it's about me. It's not about me. It's about God. And we, we look at the things where it talks about, well, He'll supply all my needs. You know, He'll, he'll, he'll heal me. He'll bless me. Those things are true. But they're almost anecdotal to the, to the whole story. They're there. They're in the Scripture, and they, they'll, they can ha they'll happen if you believe. But the truth is the story is about this great highway from ruin to restoration. Yeah. From Genesis all the way through. It's the same story. Uh -huh. And every word is prophetic. Yes. This is prophecy because it came from God. And Paul said, y'all are prophets. You should covet the office of the prophet. Why? Because when you speak like God, you get what God gave. Yeah. It's not just prophesying so I can wave my hand over you and say that, well, you know, six months from now, you're going to get a new car and the house will be paid. He may say that, but the truth is, what you really need, the prophecy you need is that you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Yes. That you have already been delivered. That you've already been set free. God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. Prophesy what God said. Yes, that's right. We've got a lot of false prophets in the church. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Talking about my cancer. You know, my, my heart disease. My bankruptcy. My... Yeah. Shut the hell up. Because that's where that's coming from. Yes. It ain't coming from God. We know what God said. Amen. There is no lack. Amen. Amen. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Right. Every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you condemn them. Yes. Yes. Shut up. Go back where you came from. Yeah. The devil, he, he, he can't hurt you. Exactly. He's defeated. All he can do is try to spook you. All he can do is try to scare you. Right. Get in your head and let, get you to listen to natural things that are going on around you, and yes. then he'll just dump on you. Uh -huh. Amen? Amen. You, you get the feeling, amen, and thinking, uh -huh. you need to get back to exactly the way of a prophet and start saying what God said. Amen? amen? amen. And God will feed you yes. by the ravens, yes. by a widow woman. Yes. He's got, he, there's no limit to how he can do it. The, the things that you would think would be the last thing that God could use, He can use it to show His glory, to show His power and His authority. Yes. Now, come on, he's do, He did this, and He didn't do it just for them to write a little story about it. No. He did it so we would see His faithfulness yes. to His Word. Yes. Now, he says, I'm going to have a church that is without spot, without wrinkle. It's going to come down out of heaven or out of the spirit realm as a city. A bride adorned yep. for her husband. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Esther's got nothing on us. Mm -hmm. Esther was just a little type and a little shadow to show what the beauty and the power of the bride of the king can do. Yes. The influence it can have on yes. nations. Amen. That's us. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. These are exciting times to be in. It's a great time to be in the Lord and to know what God is doing and to be a part of it. Praise God.